Right, should be able to see that now. So just a quick recap from yesterday. This is what you should have done to end yesterday in those last sort of 10, 15 minutes. Uh, these were the uh, definitions or explanations, I should say, that I gave you from... Oh, go away, teams. See, it's just interrupting me. Um, these are the explanations that you should have matched. So, idée fix, as we went through yesterday, the French for fixed idea, devised by Berlioz, and it's that recurring theme which undergoes transformation and then unifies. It's the one constant thread that goes through the piece and gives it a sense of uh, structure. Okay. Um, go away. Um, the Symphony Fantastique, the unusual thing in the second movement on that little clip we saw was those two harps depicting the elegance of the ballroom. The choice of two harps was quite different for the time. Collegno, Italian for with the wood, right? So turning the bow around and tapping the strings with the wood of the bow rather than bowing it with the hairs of the bow. Um, so it's a term, you know, we're going to come across more often as we get further into Romantic era, particularly with Impressionist music because in Impressionist music, the instruments are used in an all, all manner of weird and wonderful ways to create different palettes of sound. Um, there's the background, of course, for the Symphony Fantastique, composed in 1830. Um, Love artist takes opium to commit suicide. Okay. Um, the other program symphonies, we didn't mention this, but we should have been able to guess it. Um, Harrod in Italy and Romeo and Juliet were two other program symphonies that Belly was composed. Now, this word we didn't go through, but hopefully we would have got it through process of elimination. The Ophiclide or the Ophiclide um, was a brass instrument that is now obsolete. It does not exist anymore. Um, not, you know, it, you can still get them, but they're not used anywhere now. And it was the predecessor of the tuba. So the tuba takes over from the Ophiclid later on in the 19th century. But it's worth mentioning here, Berlioz used it to give that uh, brass section even more depth. But we're also going to see that instrument when we look at Verdi Requiem later on in the year as well. So it's just worth dropping that in as an introduction at this point. Um, Symphony Fantastic, the fourth movement instrumentation, there was that very, very vulgar orchestration where that Fortissimo chord is the guillotine blade that falls down the score, and then the pizzicato strings is the head bouncing off the platform into the basket, right? All a bit silly, um, but imaginative nonetheless. Uh, the characteristics of romanticism, programmatic elements, the presence of the supernatural, greater freedom in form, more ambiguity of rhythm, and that's a really good word to use when describing some of this music from the Romantic era and indeed the 20th century. Composers trying to create ambiguity. So, ambiguity of rhythm, ambiguity of tonality, yeah, ambiguity of texture, you know, mixing odd things together, right? In the classical period, we had our primary chords and our stable structures and our stable phrases and everything else. Um, you've got um, far greater flexibility now if you imagine a color you know colors you think oh what goes nicely or if i mix red and you know blue together i get purple what if i mix purple and orange you know it's not something you'd think of doing but then this is what composers are trying to do trying to get different types of um mixes together in all the elements right this french for bell is cloche straightforward the ball was the second movement, okay, where that ED fix came in and interrupted the waltz that we listened to. Program symphony, that's the general overall term, and that's the definition for it. And it was the fourth movement we listened to, or the extract from it, March to the Scaffold. Okay. Dreams in a fit of jealousy has killed his love, his beloved, and been sentenced to death. So those were the um, things that I left you with to do yesterday, is that's what you should have got. Um, you should be just be able to access your booklet from yesterday off the Google Classroom, of course. So just go on to the one that you 
had yesterday, or even if you go into your classwork or whatever it is, and it should just be reopening from then. All the changes should have saved uh, centrally for you. All right. So we've looked at the concert overture, and the example we looked at was the Mendelssohn um, Fingal's Cave, the Hebrides Overture. We've looked at a program symphony, and probably the most famous program symphony of all, Symphony Fantastique. Um, so now we're going to look at a symphonic poem or tone poem. So that's the first thing you need to be aware of. Symphonic poem or tone poem. Effectively the same thing. And it's a piece of orchestral music, usually in a single continuous section that illustrates or evokes the content of a poem, a short story, a novel, a painting, a landscape, or any other non-musical source. So that is a, a standard um, description for all programmatic music, really, this bit here, evoking the content of a non-musical source. But the difference now, rather than it being a very, very short piece, like a 10 minute, uh, like the concert overture, just to start a concert off, or the symphony, which is in its separate movements. This is one single continuous section, right? Now, some of these symphonic poems aren't that much longer than concert overtures anyway. Some of them are hugely longer, right? Some of them are like half hour long, right? But we can think of the symphonic poem in some ways related to opera. While it does not use a sun text, it seeks like opera, a union of music and drama, not dissimilar to the program symphony. Okay, the symphonic poem. Now the guy who's credited with inventing these, establishing them and then really um, giving music it, its, um, the sense of importance of that this new genre was going to have was Franz Liszt. Okay. Now on the documentary you watched from the BBC on Monday, there's a lot of focus on Liszt and Liszt is an extremely underrated person. And in that documentary, um, Howard Goodall, the presenter of that documentary goes a long way to um, correcting that. And he does those sort of, different list he does those put six points and lots of the innovations that list brought to the table in the 19th century paved the way for all the other composers around him he was extremely influential as a performer as a teacher as a composer of course right um and in the mid part of the century he was arguably the most famous musician on the earth right or certainly in europe um, because, of course, you know, communication and travel between other far reaches of, of the earth were not as easy in the 19th century as they are now. Coronavirus aside, of course. Um, so at the height of his fame, so mid-century, he was a virtuoso pianist. And I really mean virtuoso pianist. And we're going to look at some virtuoso piano work tomorrow. Um, the term virtuoso literally means stuff that's technically very demanding and allows the performer to show off all of that technical capability, right? So he was an amazing pianist and he would travel the world. And indeed, when he visited Liverpool, um, audiences of thousands screamed and fainted. And when Liszt dropped a glove, respectable ladies scratched and kicked each other to get it. So this is like... Bieber mania, but 160, 170 years ago, right? They called it Listomania. So you think Beatle mania in the 1960s, um, that's where the term comes from. List was the first like proper worldwide star, right? Um, he was quite the ladies' man. He had number a number of partners um, and lived a pretty rock and roll life, as we would term it. Right. Uh, talking about the piano, and we'll talk about this a bit more tomorrow. But it's we think of how pianos are now, with the big iron frames in the middle of them. The way piano manufacturers are now making pianos is largely down to list. 
because the pianos of the early part of the 19th century, Liszt used to play them on stage and they'd literally fall apart. They would collapse because he'd give them such a hammering. Um, they couldn't withstand the beating he, he, they took. So they had to like make these instruments far more robust to take the, the pounding they were getting from the player. But also as the orchestra's grew, the piano needed to become louder and bigger and more robust in that sense. But again, a lot of that comes back to list and how we were starting to innovate and write for the instrument, all right? So, as was mentioned, I said on Monday, List is credited with founding this form of composition, and this is the um, tone poem that was discussed in that BBC documentary. We're going to look at Prometheus, okay? Um, now, Prometheus is a story, okay? Prometheus stole and gave to mankind a godlike gift, creative fire. So Prometheus steals fire from the gods, and his punishment from the gods for stealing fire is that a vicious tormentor, Zeus's bloodthirsty eagle, would come every day, sent down from Mount Olympus, to tear apart his flesh with claws and bloodily devour his liver. So that is a beautiful story, um, beautiful myth. Um, but of course, that is a story that for a composer in the 19th century is like manna from heaven. You've got to think that's an amazing story for me to try and depict in music because it's so dark, it's so gory, it's full of imagery, yeah? You've got this bloodthirsty eagle coming down to snack on, a, on your essential organs every day for eternity right so of course within that there's a huge amount of um interpretation that a composer can take right and as i said at the end many tales of death destiny and suffering were taken as inspiration for compositions in this romantic era now we're going to listen to um the piece here. We're not going to listen to the whole thing. Uh, the whole piece is about 12 minutes. We're actually going to listen to most of it. We're going to listen to about eight minutes of it or so. George, um, yeah. I can't edit my um, the thing, but I think I've sent you a request too. Oh, hang on. I'll have a look now. Tell you what you could do. Go to file, see at the top here, and go make a copy. Yeah. You make a copy, I would, and then you should be able to edit it. Okay. All right. Okay, thank you. It's probably the quickest way of doing it. Okay, thank you. No problems. Um, so before we listen to it, this is what you will be doing. Okay, so listen to the first section of Prometheus from the above link. So four emotions, list explained, constitute the entirety of the work. Boldness, suffering, perseverance, and redemption. Okay, so these are the four emotions that List is associating with all of this story. Obviously, the boldness of Prometheus to steal from the god, like from the gods, the suffering, then the perseverance of having to, you know, live with this eternal punishment, and then the redemption of being able to come through it. All right. So what I've done is I've labelled those themes on the score. Right, so we're just going to listen to it first of all, and I'll talk over it as well and explain a few things. And then what I'm going to do, I'm going to leave you to it for the rest of the time. You can listen back to this then on the YouTube link or off the, um, the link there. Um, and I want you to complete this table, but complete it in a fair bit of detail if you can. So I've got the four emotions here, and we'll see what they are when we listen to the score now. And I want you to comment on the harmony and tonality orchestration and texture, and the melodic material for each of those um, themes or moods and how he achieves the sort of dramatic effect by controlling those musical elements, okay? So here is the... Let's get the right one up here. Bear with me. Too much going on, John. Um, here we go. Okay. 
done just before we started. Stop, stop, stop. Um, just a quick look at the score, right? Um, you can see it's a much bigger orchestra than what we came across with Mozart, right? Much bigger orchestra than what we saw with the Mendelssohn um, yesterday with the Hebrides Overture. So we've got piccolo flute. So we've got piccolo now. We're extending the boundaries of the woodwind section. We haven't just got two flutes, two oboes. We now have a piccolo, two flutes, okay? So it's five flirten. This is a German score. It's five flirten, it's five hoburn, so two oboes. English horn. What would that be? English horn is the core only. Okay. So again, we've got a lower version of the oboe. Two clarinets in C and two bassoons. So straight away, you see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There's ten instruments in the woodwind section, whereas we would normally expect in the classical orchestra, half a dozen. So it's virtually doubled in size, but not just doubled in size, the timbre has expanded. So now we've got this deeper oboe reedy sound in the core anglais. We've got the higher flute sound with the piccolo playing an octave above, right? Then the brass in the middle, we've got one, two horns in E and three, four horns in E. We've got four horns, right? Four of them, much deeper sound. Two trumpets in C, two tenor posaunen, that's your trombone. Basso posaunen, so that's the um, bass trombones. We've got three trombones and tuba. Three pauken in C and F, pauken is um, the timpani. And interesting thing about the timpani here, if you look at this opening section, it starts off on those opening six bars on an F and immediately goes up to an F sharp. So you're thinking, hang on, we've got a timpani that's playing two notes a semitone apart. So immediately we can tell now that there's been developments in the manufacturing of these instruments, no longer we like in the Mozart, where the timpani was restricted to playing the tonic and dominant. You know, one drum for D and one drum for A, and you'd only be able to play them when you were in that key. Now, the timpani have the pedals, as the modern ones do, and they can tighten or slacken the drum skin in order to... Um, in order to change the pitch effectively and quickly. So in that rest there, the player can tighten the string and make it a little bit stronger, okay? Um, also, you've got three of the instruments as well, so it gives you a bit of flexibility as well. Um, and of course, at the bottom there, we've got our strings as normal. Violin ones, violin twos, oboes, that's oboes, violas, cellos, and double basses. Right? So it's a big orchestra. It is a big orchestra. Right? So we're going to listen to this opening section. So bars 1 to 12 is lists um, music for boldness, for the theme of boldness. Here we go. Yeah. 
box. Bassoon, viola, odd instruments for melody. Notice how irregular the phrases are. Though. All sort of meanders about, there's no pattern to it. It sounds like a lament, nonetheless. But there's that word ambiguity, it's very ambiguous. Send it from right up top, it's down down here. Now we're into a new theme. The suffering. section again. Strings.
and there's about four minutes left of the um, of the full version, right? So all I want you to do now in your own time is go back and fill that table in, and just try and get as many, try and describe what's going on using as many terms as you can, right? So when we're talking about that opening section of boldness, right? What can we say about on our sheet? Melodic material, for example, you know, phrase length, what about the range of it? I'm talking about orchestration, it's obviously quite full. How is the texture working? What's the texture in, that, in those bars? What's the texture at the beginning? What's the texture here as it builds up, right? What's the harmony? Got F then and F sharp. Do we know it is a key definitely given to us, right? Think of the terms you would normally use. These chords here, could I look at these chords and try and work out what's going on? Yeah? So that's the type of thing I want you to do, right? The labelings are there for you, right? Um, it's 10 past 10 now. What I suggest you do is, now carry on and do this in your own time, right? And um, what I'll do, I'll check in then on your sheets and... Um, Make sure that sort of the, the comments are as they should be. And I'll go over this to start off tomorrow's lecture then. Not tomorrow's lecture. There isn't a lecture tomorrow. And of course, there isn't a lecture on Friday because it's bank holiday on Friday. Um, so what I'll do, I'll go through this, I'll review this on Monday, right? In Monday's lecture uh, in the afternoon. I'll go through these bits. I'll upload the video of this lecture and yesterday's and send them through to you. So if you want to, you know, um, go over the stuff I've discussed in those two sessions, you can. But spend some time now, have a listen to that again, right, and make some notes and then type them into that table, okay? Everyone clear on what they've got to do? Yeah. Well, thank you, folks. I shall okay. see you on Monday, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.